we actually did a poster um, reflecting our paper, which was a brief review, a uh, qualitative review looking at the last two to three years of neuroinflammation and alcohol abuse. Uh, the key takeaways that we found from this were that uh, we found that the neuroinflammatory process in and of itself drives epigenetic changes, which ultimately upregulate neuroinflammation in the brain. This is important because we know that neuroinflammation leads to neurotoxicity, which leads to neuronal degeneration. And as we know with patients who chronically abuse alcohol, they do have a, a level of cortical degeneration that we often see on imaging. So there is perhaps a role that this may play in that. Also of note, we found that uh, the actual neuroinflammatory process, when it drives the epigenetic changes, it impacts the, uh, the amygdala. So we know that the amygdala often gets what we say is hot, so it's a high stress. Uh, part of the brain um, and what we found in animal models so far is that uh, if we can impact where that epigenetic change occurs we can prevent the anxiogenic behaviors we often see in alcohol withdrawal and abstinence we associate that in humans to be the the high stress state we often see in patients when they're not drinking uh, or withdrawing from alcohol so they even took it a step further when they looked at um, what happens at that epigenetic level is by asking themselves can we use certain medications? So they use things like vitamin C, pioglitazone, which is a diabetes medication, infliximab, a monoclonal antibody. Uh, they even used omega-3 fatty acids, and they found that all these medications do impact neuroinflammation and stop neurotoxicity from occurring, also in turn preventing the epigenetic changes. So if we kind of take this, uh, what we take away from this is uh, we ask ourselves, what are we doing and what can we do moving forward? It's not to say that uh, the medications we use are bad right now, but are there ways that we can augment what we already do? So we know that things like naltrexone and acamprostate work on that reward pathway in uh, addiction. Now we have something potentially moving forward that can uh, do some of the ancillary stuff, working on the, the withdrawal effects, helping with the behavioral responses that we see in patients who uh, are suffering from addiction. None of this has been studied in humans yet, but again, I, I find it hard to imagine that something like vitamin C or uh, omega-3 fatty acids would be too, too difficult for a patient to take or, or would interfere with some of their other medications that they may or may not be on. When we look at supplements and some of the other medications that we may or may not be using right now, is there's a lot we don't know. And as we start to learn more and more about how pathology happens within the brain, you know, we start to see that some of these other things may be beneficial. So, uh, the nutritional side of things, the diet, the exercise. We've long known that these things help improve mental health issues, but we haven't necessarily known why or how that actually occurs. So as we start to learn more, I, I, I certainly can envision a, a time in the future where uh, we are using more supplements, uh, not to you know, over-medicate, but to kind of help fill in the gaps.